there's a new paradigm of fans that can be involved before the stream and potentially involved for a long time before the stream to the point where maybe they're having some taking in one example weekly surveys about should a character wear a red or blue costume or should the characters explore this or that location it's not like a binding contract kind of input but it's real fan input along the way you're listening to lights camera crypto the podcast exploring all things entertainment and web3 I'm your host, Stephen Ladden, and this week our guest is Next Cypher founder, Jeff Garzik. In this episode, Jeff discusses being fascinated with science fiction as a kid and reading about decentralized currencies. So in 2010, when he was first exposed to Bitcoin, he immediately knew it was the future. And while Jeff was one of Bitcoin's key developers and went on to be somewhat of a serial entrepreneur, starting companies like Vesper Finance and Space Chain, Entertainment held a particularly special place in his heart, which led him eventually to create Next Cypher Productions. Next Cypher is a Web3 media company that focuses on the production of traditional film and television with the added element of fan engagement. Let's dive in. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Really interested in learning more about you and your path and how all of that has culminated with Next Cypher Productions. Early on, growing up, did you always have an interest in media, in tech, in the convergence of the two? Where was that interest really cultivated from? Yeah, I think I was always fortunate to grow up around technology from my, my youngest days. My father used to build these kits called Heath Kit where uh, this was back in the late early 80s excuse me and you could solder together computers it wasn't just all silicon chips and t seven nanometer uh, fabrication and uh, so i really had a tech gadgety dad he could never convince me to uh, get into changing the oil of my car i was never into mechanicals like he was but uh, he, he taught me computers at an early age. I was programming BASIC and Pascal at the age of eight. So I was just always a nerd from the earliest days. <laughs> and also for my father, he worked in the White Sands Missile Range and the U.S. military's various rocketry projects. And that got me pulled into aerospace and he would take me to space shuttle launches. And for a kid in the 80s, that was just living in the future. And so it's not just aerospace, but you get to see astronauts literally going to other planets. And right. what a what an amazing time that was. And that just sparked so much imagination. Oh, combined with just being a voracious reader, I would read anything and everything I could get my hands on, whether it was pulpy, cheesy science fiction or real heady Isaac Asimov science fiction or anything of that nature. I just sponged every little bit of it. And it, it really gives you an idea of what are the future possibilities and how science fiction as a storytelling medium in a little bit of ways. And I I think you can look backwards over the past 40 years and say this is true, is it predicts the future in fits and starts. And some of the things with, for example, Steven Spielberg's movie AI is a lot of that's now in the year 2023 coming true in, in many ways. And that's just a sliver of the things that were science fiction and became science reality. And I, I just saw that pattern over and over again, that science fiction to science reality transition. And I knew I had to get involved. I knew that our authors from Arthur C. Clarke to Asimov to directors like Lucas and Spielberg were, they were telling the stories that not only resonated and entertained, but inspired. And I don't know any of the directors, for example, of the Star Trek TNG episodes, but all of those were also a very inspirational not only to me, but to NASA scientists, to startup entrepreneurs, to people who are really building the next generation of science. From an early age, that was me. I love the future, and it seemed like science fiction, whether it's TV shows or movies or books, 
was a channel to, in 1980, what 2023 might look like. So you were very much then, it sounds predisposed to follow the path that you ended up going on in terms of getting involved in Bitcoin. And that sounds more of just an extension of everything you just mentioned. It really is. And there, there's an even stark example. I was waiting for Bitcoin to happen, thanks to science fiction. And what I mean by that is in the late 90s or mid 90s, a tabletop game, a spinoff of Dungeons and Dragons called Shadow Run was popular. And this tabletop game was basically Dungeons and Dragons, but cyberpunk Dungeons and Dragons, but in the future. And it, it spawned not only the tabletop game, but a series of novels, which, which is how I found it. And in the novels, they had digital currency. And mm. in the 90s, it was just assumed, and you can see this in other science fiction, uh, authors just assume that digital currency is going to exist. And so I grew up with my base assumption of it might not be invented yet, but this thing is going to exist. So I just need to wait for it, for some creator to create it. And I'll instantly know uh, that's the thing. And that happened July of 2010. There was a post on a website, slash.org, News for Nerds, very <laughs> popular blog website at the time, technology website, talked about Bitcoin, the decentralized currency. And thanks to Shadowrun, thanks to science fiction, thanks to voracious reading of sci-fi, I knew that was the thing. I was skeptical on the tech side. I was a very, very deep technologist at the time. And I thought in my mistaken egotism that surely it can't be fully decentralized. But happily, it's, it's open source. And for those that don't know, that means that metaphorically, you can open the hood of the car and inspect all the guts inside. And myself, as an engineer, I, ha I have the ability to to evaluate that, I looked at Bitcoin and it was the real thing. It was that decentralized cross-border type currency that I had read about literally decades ago. In the novels, they called it New Yen, N-U-Y-E-N, because it was very Japanese manga inspired uh, sure. at the time. But that was the Bitcoin beacon 20 years early, and I just knew to wait for it. And what, when you encountered it, what did it activate you to do? Immediately, I, I just wanted to spread the knowledge. I was, before the crypto bro was a term, I was maybe <laughs> one of those in that I was trying to get my, my contractors to accept Bitcoin, my dentists and doctors to accept Bitcoin, try this new digital currency that I knew would take, have some part in shaping the future, as indeed it did. You can all, you can look back. I can look back and grin at all the ways that I was a na naive youngster, even in my late thirties, but just, I knew that it was the future. I knew I have the analogy to gunpowder. I knew it was a lot like gunpowder in that it's going to change everything. Some people are going to blow their fingers off and get hurt. Some people will create amazing companies that transform the world. Some people will sadly, pessimistically use it to victimize others. And it's that, that double-edged sword of all new technology. But, but again, I knew that this was just inevitable thanks to science fiction. And it's just what form would that inevitability take? And that was Bitcoin. And do you think because of that early predisposition to science fiction that it made your, the ventures you became involved in, Vesper Finance, Block, those forays more natural, more, it felt more aligned because you'd already envisioned a future in which you were participating in real time? Absolutely. It Again, when you see the future happening right in front of you, at least my natural inclination is how do I help build the future? How do I participate in the future? One of the things that I teach in my mentoring, teach my kids, is whenever there's innovation happening, experience it. It might not be for you. It might be for you 
but you're always going to expand your knowledge. You're going to expand your experience. You're going to learn lessons. You're going to see that you have skills that you never knew you had. And so even if you don't pursue it, you will have gained a lot from it. And that's proof. That's been a pattern in my life personally. And I think a, a way to be successful for others in life in general is in the the early 90s, when I was at Georgia Tech at university, I put the student newspaper on the web when the web was an early thing. And that, in the that days of led dialogue. to the opportunity of pulling a number of my colleagues and myself over to CNN to put CNN on the web. And for university students listening, I was not paid to do that. I was not asked to put the student newspaper on the web. I just saw that there was a new technology and thought, how can how can the student newspaper benefit? And I'd hope that students would have similar inspirations today with AI or VR or pick any number of new technologies is how can you apply that to your life? And then what doors will that open in your life as a result of that? Everything you're describing, it, it does have, you referenced, I think the East Asian culture earlier in this conversation. Everything has an, a holistic approach that you've incorporated into how you're talking about inspiration in tech and stuff like that. Is that a big influence again into mindset and easeability when thinking about technology in the future? It is. It really is. It's, I guess it was ingrained in my DNA very early just to keep looking forward, keep marching forward. That, that helps in the adversity side is just heads down, just keep marching forward. The next day is going to be a new day. But also on the inspiration optimistic side is that I know that there are billions and billions of people working to make their lives better and collectively that's got to move us all forward in really interesting and inspirational ways. And again, just science fiction was one of the biggest, I'd say, inputs into that. And not only books, but really film in particular, TV, perhaps as a third. I'd rank movies, books, and TV in terms of inspiration in that order. Because there's nothing that really substitutes for that experience, total immersion, going to a movie theater. It's a movie you've never seen before, and you're just completely immersed, completely blown away by the story, the characters, the emotion. And I remember seeing, for example, Jodie Foster in Contact, another another mid-90s movie. All my, all my culture is like stuck <laughs> in the 90s and 2000s, I'm afraid. And that movie, it was in part written and overseen on the technical side by Arthur C. Clarke. No, Carl Sagan, excuse me. And they paid a particular attention to scientific accuracy. And that inspired so many university students to start looking at aerospace. And so this kind of thing has, again, real world impact. When one of my startups, Space Chain, we've had, we've launched seven objects into low earth orbit wow uh, whether to the international space station or literally a cube set floating in space and that again would not have happened without myself being inspired in science fiction and elon musk being inspired by science fiction and bringing down the cost of rocketry by mm. one one thousandth of the previous cost so startups that could never ever access space can now pay what is a lot of money, a couple hundred thousand dollars, but compared to a billion dollars, sure, it's yeah. suddenly so much more accessible to entrepreneurs like myself. And that, that came out of thinking about the future in a positive way, writing stories, spinning tales about the future. In terms of, first of all, I love the, I love how inspired you were from different types, as you mentioned, of media, but movies in particular, and how, with the example of Contact, how it illustrates how far-reaching certain pieces of content can have on different industries and just the power of different types of media to inspire and to then help perpetuate continual change and continual growth of a society in different facets. With respect to your own entrepreneurship, what 
what was one of the leading drivers for your new, I say new, it's, it was formed in 2022, one of your recent endeavors, new site, next cipher. What's sort of in that DNA in terms of what you hope to with the company and what's the ethos that you're bringing to it? Yeah, after 20 years of being a technologist, I really inspired by science fiction. I felt like I wanted to give back. I felt that I have, like many, have a number of stories bursting out of my head and wanting to be on paper, on screen. I think many of us are budding storytellers and screenwriters. But beyond that, and specifically where crypto comes into play, was the NFT craze, which is burned off a little bit now, but it was very inspiring in terms of there's a lot of innovation I felt that could be done on the fan side, the fan experience side, where as it stands now, compare and contrast, a production will be under development behind the scenes and pre-production behind the scenes in production post. And then eventually it streams a year or two after the original kind of first kernel of an idea kicked off. That, that first pilot script got handed to a network executive. That process is a year or two minimum. And during that time, to me, that's dead air where fans could be start to get excited about a property. They could start to think about uh, what is this story arc? Obviously you want to do all the, you don't want to give away spoilers or, or anything like that, but there's a new paradigm of fans that can be involved before the stream and potentially involved for a long time before the stream to the point where maybe they're having some taking in one example, weekly surveys about should a character wear a red or blue costume or should the characters explore this or that location? It's not mm -hmm. like a binding contract kind of input, but it's real fan input along the way. And you can also have fan experiences. One lucky fan gets a trip to a production location or a fan gets to have a 30 minute zoom with the show runners to pitch their own idea or something of that nature. We really were thinking what are the most immersive fan experiences that not just the TV shows that we're producing, but every movie, every single TV show on the planet should have in terms of fan, super fan connectivity, super fan stickiness, and those kind of events, engagements that could go well earlier in time on the pre-production side and then post continue while after it starts streaming. So I it was just to me a green field of how much better can we make the fan experience? Better stories and better fan experience. And also it sounds like community too would be built Absolutely. around ar around the properties and around through that experience you'd be having a much more rich participation really and, and integration with whatever media you're focused on here, which, which kind of takes away the passivity of, all right, I'm, I'm immersing myself passively by watching something. Now you're engaging with that material in a much more active way. Yeah, that, that's a good way to put it. And there's, we hope a little bit of fan ownership in that they have a they have some input in how things are shaped and developed and hopefully when it starts streaming you can shout at the screen i i influenced how that costume or that prop went or uh, i won a copy of that prop in a fan contest that sort of thing and that is the fan experience that we're really going towards. Interacting with the actors, actresses, sets, producers. How rich can we make the fan experience? We really just want to we want to push the bounds in all of those locations. What can you speak to currently? I know you have some new developments that you might have to keep under the hood, but what projects that you're working on currently can you talk about? how this experience is playing out. Another way of asking this question is, are there any current projects that you have that you can speak to of how this sort of fan integration is taking shape? 
Sure, absolutely. Folks can always visit our website, nextcypher.com. We just open up our beta fan site, nxcfans.com. And if you have one of the NFTs called a multi-pass, we all love Fifth Element, called a multi-pass for our Looking Glass production. That's one of our in-house developments. We originated that universe. It's a very expansive kind of year 2070 cypherpunk future type story where a female protagonist, Allie, falls through the looking glass, as in Alice in Wonderland. She's a, she's an upper middle class, very kind of everyday person, and she discovers that the world of shadow runners and grid runners is bubbling beneath the surface, and suddenly she's dropped down the rabbit hole, and she has to live in the world of shadow runners, grid runners, mercenaries, and find her way in a strange new world. It's a world of class divisions and he has and she hasn't drama set amidst a real exciting futuristic type universe. And that's Looking Glass, one of our properties. And for the folks that have our NFT associated with that, that unlocks a digital download of a graphic novel that we had produced. You can get it on Amazon.com, but you get it for free. If you have our NFT, it's like our fan club holding the NFT. You can also get a physical copy of that same graphic novel sent to your house. You'll have Comic-Con passes, chance to win Comic-Con passes, chance to win trips to where we're going to be filming in Bulgaria uh, on set late this year in one of our productions. Cool. Uh, and a lot of other a lot of other fan engagement type things. Our second production is Deathlands, which is based on a series of novels in the 1980s, which a post-apocalyptic type Mad Max scenario, which is a very hardy survival characters in a strange land type of story that that we're real excited about. We're shopping both of those around right now for a buyer. And then our third production is an unscripted nonfiction called Future.gov. And it's all about seasteading and network states and crypto nations and all of these sort of new innovations on the countryside. So those are our three studio productions. I can't go into detail on the status of those, but we definitely are going to have some exciting news to share in the very short term about one of those that I just listed. Very cool. And in terms of, you mentioned buyers, are you taking these projects, the traditional media route in terms of finding a studio or a network or what's that process like given that these are more richer projects in terms of fan experience and there's a lot more tied into as you're talking about the value of the nft and what that gets you and how does that either aid or limit your you going out to buyers and that process I think it's very much additive. So we're a hybrid model in that we go the traditional studio financing route for our productions. But what the Web3 NFT fan engagement platform brings us is provable fan base in that we can walk in the door and say, we're not just pitching a script. We're pitching a script that has a fan base behind it. We're pitching a script that ha already has engagement on day negative 100 that we can walk in the door and say, these people are interested in this. One of the things that I'm learning is being new to entertainment. I'm a multi-decade technologist and entrepreneur and investor, but new to this industry. So I'm learning a lot every day. And for from the business side, they distinguish between original IP and established IP. Being original is a story that you just came up with yesterday. You just wrote the script or several scripts and you're developing your own idea. Established IP is you're licensing a Star Wars, a Star Trek, a Captain Planet. You have the option to develop that into a movie or a TV series episodic. 
And I'm learning that they really established IP because there's that track record. There's that they can look at data and say people liked this property. And so that's what the NFT and Web3 fan platform bootstraps us into is that even without an established IP, we can say there is regardless, there's a fan base here and there's a graphic novel and there are readers behind the graphic novel and there's an engaged community of hundreds, potentially thousands already. And this thing hasn't even been produced. That's the, that's, we make that argument on the business side and on the fan side, we make the argument that if you're here early, the experience is going to be richer. You're going to have some sway over the direction. And when it does stream, it'll be that much dearer to your heart. And in terms of the ownership piece, helping keep the project near and dear to one's heart, ownership, of course, I'm referring to in terms of the NFT, uh, you mentioned it can be more of a pass into the community. Is there anything that a fan would actually tangibly own in terms of content that's being produced? Does the NFT help? Is it more of a pass that allows for that accessibility, as you mentioned, a trip to Bulgaria potentially? Or is there some monetary stake that they now have in a particular project? I'll take the last first. I would love to have a monetary stake but there's so much legal mumbo jumbo surrounding that it becomes quite complicated. I've across multiple companies spent literally millions of dollars with <laughs> corporate attorneys, securities attorneys, just making sure that all the crypto legals are onshore and up and legally compliant and all that good stuff. So we're there are a lot of exciting ideas, but they have yet to fully pass that regulatory legal attorney type test. Everyone wants to do a revenue share with fans, which would be super cool. You know, we would love to do something like that. Even better is an ownership, a literal ownership stake in a movie property or even a movie studio. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of red tape and yellow tape around both of those ideas. So those are things that we and others are absolutely working towards, but that's going to be years down the line once all the attorneys figure out who reports to what. So it's firmly in the realm of you get some influence, you get some emotional ownership, but not as of yet legal ownership. That's something that we absolutely love to give. It, it's what Kickstarter and many of the other GoFundMe type sites, they would love to do equity as well. But again, the red tape, there's just a lot of regulation, securities and commodities regulations that, that really put a damper on some of our entrepreneurial ideas. In place of, say, the financial component, it sounds like, though, there's been concerted effort to create and develop a creative stake in, as you mentioned, having these little, call them small, but creative asks to the community and the holders of, hey, would we want a particular shirt to look like? Or giving a little bit of input, which I think goes a long way. It does. And I grew up with, this is very anachronistic now, but I grew up with a series of books called Choose Your Own Adventure books. Yes. And you would read a little bit of a story and then it'd give you a multiple choice question. Does your character make a left turn or a right turn? If you're making a left turn, turn to page 200. If you're making a right turn, turn to page 300. And it was, it was a lot of fun how the, the story would branch. But again, it gives you a sense of control over the story is you're steering the story to a certain amount and there are multiple outcomes, which makes it really interesting. Maybe the hero doesn't succeed in the end, or maybe he, he, he saves old Yeller from dying or something like that. And I think having that level of fan input is really speaks to some of the super modern generative AI stuff that's coming out right this second as we're recording this. So I think the future, as we're recording this too, there's a writer's strike on, and I really see the future as being a boon to writer in the AI 
sense in that writers will be able to just dream and that's going to self animate and create almost from a spoken word straight to movie. It's going to be an incredible revolution. Some of the stuff that people are doing with Adobe Photoshop update that again was released this week. You can just sketch something and say, I want a deer inside this blob and it'll put a photorealistic deer in there. And then you can click a button and say animate and it'll animate that deer. And so the next logical step is literally going to be the storytellers are kings. The storytellers are coming up with the stories and the computers will draw the characters, animate them in set, add transitions. You'll have directors and writers as the first principles of these episodic TV shows, movies. And it again, it's so exciting to be alive with all this science fiction, changing stories forever. And that's part of why we started Next Cypher is just to be in it at a, an amazing time. And what a time it is. And so you're, just to understand, like you're thinking then, which I, gets back to thinking positively about tech shifts and stuff like that, that the AI tools could benefit writers and creators in the sense that it's not replacing them. It's saying, hey, you don't have to sit at the computer and perhaps take what's in your mind and convert it into words. You can literally at some point speak into a device which will capture your thoughts, which will then convert that into something for you, i.e. an animated rendering. And then all of a sudden, you it's basically, it's a different way of doing the same thing. That's exactly right. You can speak aloud and create storyboards, speak aloud and do pre-visualization runs of your entire film. And imagine going to a studio and you're not putting a script in front of them, you're putting an entire pre-vis of your film in front of the studio executive. Sure. That That's pretty mind-blowing. Yeah, absolutely. Considering that to do that now, the or the traditional way, if you wanted to shoot a proof of concept or a sizzle or something, that still in itself requires the coordination of talent and shoots and sound. You, it's still the full production for showcasing a, a snippet of what something could be. Not only from the way that you're describing this, would that help save time and money for everyone across the board? It's making those potential pitch meetings much more immersive for everybody involved. Yeah, it's really exciting. All the possibilities that generative AI and AI assistants are opening up. One of my favorite recent reads is from an economist, Tyler Cowen, The Average is Over. And one of the chapters in there is on man-machine teaming. And he argues, he uses the example of chess. There's a a variant of the game of chess where you're allowed to cheat. You're allowed to use a computer to advise you on moves. But the other person on the other side of the chessboard is also allowed to you allowed to cheat, as it were, allowed to use a computer advisor. And so it's man machine versus man machine. And the point that the economist Cowan makes in his book is that it's you're just a, an operator of a tool and that gives you more power to do more and to have more expansive stories, to create just more stories. You have a ton of ideas in your head and you can visualize all those ideas rather than having to pound one out on a virtual typewriter in a hotel room for three weeks. Sylvester Stallone did with the Rocky script. Right. There's there's all this power in these new tools. And so I think that everyone just levels up their storytelling ability. I, I don't see it as a ma mass layoffs kind of thing. I think everybody can do better work kind of outcome. And if you think about it from a positive standpoint, the creative inputs that you would need to use with machine, as we're calling it on this riff, you're still, if you put in, say with ChatGPT, if you put in something that, if you put in prompts that aren't maybe the most imaginative, then your chances, yes, you'll get something unique, 
but you also may not receive the utmost you're not going to get the best perhaps output if someone who is more creatively inclined and has a different way of thinking about things could put into an AI system like that and get a result that perhaps enhances what they already do naturally. If Does that make sense? It, it does. And I think that's right. But the way I think people will more likely use it is an inspiration tool. And I'll use computer programming and chat GPT as an example is chat GPT can write source code for computer software. And so even if you're not a programmer or you're not a very good programmer, you can still type in natural language English, write me a game in Python, a dice game in Python that does this, that, and the other. I actually did this experiment and it wrote in the Python programming language source code for a dice game according to my specifications. And it was wow. a, a graphical pops up on my MacBook type game, fully working. And wow. a lot of programmers can use that kind of capability, but it's more of a first draft. That's, that's right. point number one. And point number two, there are sometimes errors in the source code and you have to be expert enough to fix what the AI wrote. And so into jumping back to Hollywood and jumping back to screenwriters, I think screenwriters will use it for that initial inspiration, that initial draft, but it's their hu human, their magic that takes over at a certain point. And it's going to be the people and their brain power and their creativity that takes over from there and writes the rest of the script. So it's more, it sounds like then that the core functionality provided by AI technology in this case will be the sort of first pass, that initial call it the vomit draft or the vomit outline <laughs> that, that exactly. some people refer to it as. And then from there, sculpting it, putting in the human, the emotive components, all of that stuff that the AI may or may not capture, but really finessing it to a place that is a more finished, po polished product. That's exactly right. And it also introduces new modes of editing, like the, the I forget if it's David Fincher or David Milch, but the creator of Deadwood, the primary producer and writer of Deadwood, he does, he writes by dictation. And mm. so he has a, a screen drafter sitting next to him and he speaks the dialogue aloud that he wants the characters in Deadwood to say. And she, the scribe will record that in the proper screenwriting format. But the point is his experience in writing, quote unquote, is 100% verbal, 100%. Mm -hmm. He does not put a single finger on a single keyboard. And yet we have Deadwood, which I absolutely love. And AI is going to offer something like that as well. The, again, the tools are very nascent, but as we record this, I can input a first draft of a script and then verbally say, I'll take that character out and replace it with this other character. And it's like the best word processor on steroids because it knows what the heck I mean by the words that I just said. I don't have to do control F, find and replace right. this character. But over and above that, it changes the scenes. It'll write a character out of a scene, which is just insane. So it's almost like a screenwriting assistant sitting right next to you. And again, the primary screenwriter is not gone from the process. They're way more productive. They're, they can just talk to their computer and say, yeah, I hate this character, edit him out of scene 32 and move scene 12 up to the first act and let's make it day instead of night. You can literally take the words I just said and input that as a prompt into AI and it can change your draft for you. Productivity goes through the ceiling, idea generation goes through the ceiling. There's just a lot of, I, I think it's, again, going to be a renaissance for Hollywood directors, Hollywood writers, and storytellers. And the way that you're describing it, too, you, you, it evokes the memory of, of the story of Spielberg driving across the hill in Los Angeles and using that time to 
speak into a tape recorder and talk through a script or a scene or something like that. So in the same way, this is the next evolution of that, which instead of him having to then go back, sit at a computer or anybody, I'm just using that as the example, but using or on our phones, same process, going for a walk, recording an idea or literally doing exactly what you were talking about. It's removing that, it's elevating that process to make it more seamless and essentially take less time, as you're saying, to then free you up to do more things. So it's in, in this way, I think the way we're framing the technology and talking about it, definitely you can see where the value is for sure. Yeah. When, when we're developing software, one of the lessons hammered home after multiple decades is it's less about the technical specifications and design process. And it all boils down to the acronym UX, which stands for user experience. And I think, and I might be wrong about this, there are plenty more screenwriters in Hollywood than I with far more experience. But I think that just being able to verbally talk to the computer and say, move this around, add this character and have it happen without you having to do so much on the shuffling virtual or physical paper aspect, you sometimes the tools get in the way. Like in a word processor, I'm trying to highlight a section and move it to the first act from the second act. And you got to do cut and paste, but then you got to do these other things. There's a lot of mechanical word processory stuff involved in heavy revisioning, whereas that interrupts your idea flow. And what if you could flow just straight from idea to page and the page keeps changing as the ideas keep flowing as no delete these four characters and send this character to a moon base. And uh, he's going to appear on a moon base in scene one, make three notes, change the outline and change the list of characters. And AI does all that literally based on just English natural language. I, I, all, all of that stuff excites me. It excites me as a story consumer. I think there'll be a lot more high quality stories and the visual quality is going to be leveled up as well. You'll be able to, again, verbally prompt CGI without having to have an entire Weta workshops department. You'll need Weta workshops if you want to do like still Lord of the Rings level stuff. There, those, those folks aren't going away. But again, if you're doing pre-vis storyboarding, that all of that's going to be photorealistic now. And it's going to be very close to what's in your head. If you can describe it with words, it can put it on a screen. Yeah. And it makes, from everything you're saying, it makes the, whether it's a doc, it, it makes the creations more fluid and alive really the documents no longer as static as perhaps it used to be it seems that from what you're saying with the more mass adoption of the greater mass adoption of verbalizing thoughts and ideas and dialogue that now the script and the sizzles are these much more fluid beings than previously instructed that's exactly right. And you can easily instruct the AI to just change the tone is change the tone of the scene to be more serious. And then again, it, the AI is not doing all the work. It's AI plus or it's computer plus person. You don't get great art without the person component. So the AI just gives you say, okay, the scene, rewrite the scene to be darker. Okay. Now it's darker, but you still as a writer have to go in and check its work and tweak the scene and make sure it flows and that sort of thing. So the person aspect doesn't go away. It just makes the person more productive. You could have it rewrite the entire episode. Say the, you get a network note, very real world example. You get a network note that your episode shouldn't be a romance episode. It should be far more action oriented. That's either a clean slate that you're banging on a keyboard for three days and nights kind of thing, or AI will take a first draft and you're just playing editor of the work. So I think, I think productivity comes from the AI and the creative comes from the human. And it's really the marriage of those two that's going to accelerate this stuff.
Very cool. In terms of that acceleration, you've mentioned two of the projects that you can talk about under the banner you guys have. What kind of coming up do you have looking forward that, that you're excited about and that you can speak to? Yeah, both of our marquee fictional projects are top of mind and we're super excited about. Looking Glass is an original production out of Next Cipher. And we feel that that really tells a story of class, the, the modern haves and have nots as our society seems to be evolving towards and how fe our female protagonist, Ali, really pushes back on that and shows a lot of strength and and gumption and intelligence and in how she navigates her world. It's super exciting. It's action packed. It's a very cyberpunk future, maybe Blade Runner evocative. And I just love that. I love that whole genre of cyberpunk. I eat it up. That's, that's looking glass. And then Deathlands is our Mad Max Max esque, Fury Road esque near-term future post-apocalyptic survival tale very popular based on a very popular set of books from the 1980s and ironically truckers helped me discover this series that's very popular at truck stops you can see stacks and stacks of deathland cds and books that Apparently they listen to on long haul adventures. It's very Pulp Fiction, maybe touches of Elmore Leonard as well in the Mad Max Furioso setting. And we just love it to death. So that's very exciting. We've got some other very early developments at our studio where frankly we're staffing up. We're growing as fast as we can to meet some of this demand. I think that there's a real demand of for good stories that are well told, dot, 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 on a budget. We, the world can't unfortunately afford tons of $100 million films, $100 million TV productions. And we think that our production staff is, knows how to make amazing content on a budget. And that's part of the reason why we're getting so much inbound interest. Very cool. And in terms of inbound interest and people maybe looking to get in touch, how can people do so? Check out our website, nextcipher, C-Y-P-H-E-R.com. Follow us on Twitter at NextCypher Pro. Awesome. Well, Jeff, I really appreciate the time and excited to see what you guys cook up with or the advancement, I should say, of the two projects you just mentioned, and then also what else is going to hop on that development slate in the coming months and years. And yeah, excited also to see how that next level of fan engagement is, a, is apparent in all of the works that you mentioned and really what that looks like for the entertainment ecosystem moving forward. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm excited as well. Personally, it's been an amazing week. We'll have some really cool news to share in the upcoming weeks. People can look back at this and see some of the hints that I gave during this episode. The Lights, Camera, Crypto podcast Easter eggs for, for exactly. those listening. <laughs> awesome. Appreciate it, Jeff. Thanks for listening to another episode of Lights, Camera, Crypto, a podcast produced by Matt Bogart and Decentral Media. Music by Brian Duncan and Kareem Imes. If you enjoyed this experience, be sure to rate and subscribe to our show and to follow at Sladen and at Decentral Media for additional content. <laughs>